Hi students, welcome to HSC Biology and this is module 5 on heredity. This particular one is video number 15 and this is the second in our little series on polypeptide synthesis. There's going to be a lot of overlap with the last video but this one is focusing a little bit more specifically on the character and nature of messenger RNA, mRNA and tRNA. So let's get into it. So what we have to do again, this is part of this whole overview of modeling the process of polypeptide synthesis. But now we want to assess the importance of mRNA and tRNA in transcription and translation. So what you should be able to do um, at the first step is to be able to contrast um, DNA and RNA to explain the particular roles of messenger RNA and transfer RNA and then assess the relative importance. And obviously we want to try and build up with our knowledge into higher levels of um, uh, understanding so that we know how to not just recall information but how to look at it in an evaluative way. The first thing we need to do is we need to look at RNA in a little bit more detail. Apart from the fact that there is a different letter in the abbreviations, that um, R as opposed to the D is ribonucleic acid, and obviously with a deoxy there is one less oxygen. So if you want to have a look at these in specific terms, and you can see from the organisation of these um, just how different... Um, or I guess not so much how different they are because there isn't much difference, but how complex they are and one of the reasons why we don't actually go into the chemistry of these structures. But here is a deoxyribosugar and here is a ribosugar and you can see it's about an oxygen. That's it. If you've drawn or had a look at the structure of um, glucose, for example, which is a hexose sugar, um, these are pento sugars, these are five carbon sugars. You'll know that there's an extra carbon in the ring, so it's a six carbon, well, it's a six member ring because oxygen does sit in this, in this ring and you get one uh, side chain coming off that. But that's the difference. Chemically, that's the only difference. The deoxy has one less oxygen um, in that OH group. Um, than the ribo sugar, so that's the that's the first difference in the backbone. So the um, if you're thinking about ladder, the upright parts, the support parts of the ladder are those sugars and phosphates, alternating sugars and phosphates. And so in the RNA, you've got the ribo sugar as opposed to deoxyribose. The other one that's important is that we have a different base. So in DNA, we have thymine. And in RNA, we have uracil. Now, that's important because um, the way that they bind is very, very similar. And so, therefore, where we have A's bonding with T's in DNA, we have A's bonding with U's in RNA. And so that's going to be useful for us as we continue through this little look um, later on. You can see, again, the structure of these is very, very similar with a very minor difference uh, between thymine and uracil. And that's one of the reasons why it will still bond to the um, adenine uh, base. The other important thing about RNA is it's a single strand. It's not a double strand. Um, and that's going to be very important for not only that process of transcription coming into the nucleus and reading the genetic code, but then transferring it out of the nucleus to the ribosome where the polypeptides are made and transferring that information into um, information that codes for specific amino acids. So we can get this growing polypeptide chain. So there, that's kind of the, the starting point, I guess. The differences between a single and a double strand, uh, ribosugar and the deoxyribosugar, and thiamine and uracil being swapped as bases, both of which still bond with adenine. So let's take that information that we know about um, RNA in general and apply it specifically to these two important processes of transcription and translation. So when we start now looking at the of transcription, we want to look at the formation of the messenger RNA. That's what's being formed within the nucleus as the code's being read. We've said before that the whole human genome is probably about 24,000 genes long. So we can't have all that information going straight to the ribosome. We have to pick and choose. 
And when we looked um, during the Year 11 course at cellular differentiation, this was one of the things that we kind of talked about, the fact that certain cells become specialized. They have specific functions and they can actually take on different appearances that correspond to those functions. How do they do that? They do that because different genes are expressed. So there's something that's going on that actually says which genes get turned on or which genes are going to be expressed and which ones are not. We call regions in front of these um, active genes, if you like, promoter regions. And promoters are little sequences of bases that are part of the DNA that are actually telling the cell this is a gene to um, use, or this is one that we want to activate. Usually the activation is a complicated process. It involves a complex, so sometimes there'll be a number of different chemicals. Um, often these are proteins, but they don't have to be. Um, that will uh, initiate or at least activate this uh, promoter region so that the um, gene will be expressed. And obviously if the promoter region is not um, activated, then those genes will remain um, unexpressed within the, um, the genome. And of course, that we know that that's the case because we know that all cells carry this information, but they don't all express all of the genes. They don't make all of the proteins that are coded for by these genes. The enzyme that's involved is RNA polymerase. And so we've kind of mentioned this before, and we've also looked at the parallel uh, with DNA polymerase during the process of DNA replication. Another region that's probably important to mention at this point now is there's lots of complexities around this whole process, as I'm sure you're starting to appreciate. And the um, challenge, I guess, is to work out how deep to go, how much of the biochemistry of these processes that you want to know. Um, I don't want to go into it in too much detail, A, because the videos just end up too long, B, because I think it's important that you have a firm grounding on each of these areas, and then you actually take little steps forward in your own understanding as you fill some of those gaps in, or, or as questions appear to you um, that you can then explore in a little bit more detail. Um, one of the things that we do know is that basically in front and behind the gene that's expressed are regions um, that are untranslated or untranslated regions, UTRs, um, they're often called. And they tend to be named based on whether they're at the front of the gene, the five prime UTRs, or behind the gene, the three prime UTRs. And that's just um, as you would have looked at from the sequences of a replication before, that's just kind of the indicating the direction of the um, DNA itself. So there's a few things that are happening. In fact, we haven't talked about things like introns and, uh, and exons, and these um, are things that are also components within these genes that, that are uh, expressed or ignored um, as the message is read. And so despite the fact that we've got 24,000 odd genes, the number of proteins can um, doesn't necessarily con correspond in a one-to-one -one ratio because some um, of these gene areas can be sort of expressed differentially. Uh, now, that's a, a complex kind of a concept that I won't go into in any more detail now, but certainly one that you can have a little bit of a look at. So leaving all of that behind, what we have is basically a promoter which starts the process of this um, mRNA generation. And then the complementarity of the bases, given that we've got U's instead of T's now, are what's going to generate this polymer of messenger RNA. And as we talked about previously, the DNA will need to unwind as this particular gene is being read or transcribed, um, but then it'll wind back up again once the messenger RNA has gone through. So it's not a complete unwinding the way that it is with replication. It's only it's kind of a little opening uh, that message is read and then it'll close again. What we need to do too is we need to look at some of the terminology that's around this. Now the codons are part of the messenger RNA. So we're looking at, we talked about in the previous video, triplets, uh, three bases to code for a particular amino acid. Well, there's also a starting point. AUG is the starting point. It also codes for methionine, but it is the starting point which basically is common to all genes, that this is the, this is the first 
point. This is where the gene starts. So everything after this is that code of important amino acids that form these proteins. Now, there are also codes that uh, indicate when to stop. So this is not just going to be a process that goes on forever. There's going to be a certain length that's going to correspond to the um, gene, which is going to then be able to be translated into a specific number of amino acids to produce a particular protein. So we have start and stop codes, as well as the codons for specific types of amino acids. What goes with the codons at the ribosome are the anticodons. So this is where transfer RNA starts to come into the process. The messenger RNA is just this nice, long, straight strand, single strand of nucleic material. And uh, it's basically split, if you like, or read in um, codons in little groups of three. Those little groups of three bind in a complementary fashion to the uh, bases that are part of the transfer RNA. Now, the transfer RNA has a different kind of a shape to the um, messenger RNA because it is doing two things. One, it is trying to bond in that um, complementary fashion, but it's also transferring, it's also picked up an amino acid and it's going to transfer that amino acid onto the growing polypeptide chain. So it needs to be able to complement the information that's coming from the messenger RNA. And as we've talked about before, if we have a C, A, G coming from the DNA, then we're going to end up with messenger RNA is going to be G, U, C. But then in the transfer RNA, as we have that complement, as we have that anticodon, so here's the codon, and then the anticodon, will be C, A, G. So you can see the double complementary nature of this process means that we get that right message going from the nucleus where the DNA can't actually transfer that message to the ribosome to the correct amino acid that's going to be transferred in at that particular point. The transfer RNA has more like a clover leaf. It's, it's often has this sort of um, shape that you'll see and uh, it's a little more complex in three dimensions. And remember that one of the important things about modeling is that we do simplify the process so that it's, um, it's designed not necessarily to show the full complexity if it was a three dimensional structure. But the important parts of the transfer RNA is the um, complementary basing. So, um, so that, that linking between the, the codon and the anticodon, the three um, nucleotide bases from the messenger RNA with the complementary bases on the transfer RNA and then the amino acid at the other end of the transfer RNA which is going to obviously link into um, the growing polypeptide chain through peptide bonds with um, other amino acids. So this is a very important um, structure as well and you can see that the the most critically important part of these processes is this complementarity here. The complements uh, are, are giving us a basically a, a reversal and then a, a reverse reversal that's bringing us right back to that original message that was part of the template strand of the DNA. Because we now have four times four times four, which is 64 different combinations of A's, G's, U's and C's, we have um, a lot of a duplication. So some more than one combination will code for the same amino acid. And here's the 20 amino acids. I'll give you these in your notes. Um, it is really not something that you need to try and memorize and know the difference between leucine and isoleucine, for example. Um, but what, we, what we're trying to do here is just give you a quick look at all of these. These are the 20 amino acids. Some of these we can actually make in our own bodies, but a number of them we cannot, and therefore we need to consume them in our food. Um, all of them are important for the process of protein synthesis. And obviously, if you have a deficiency of one or more amino acids, it may well be that there's a number of different proteins that you're no longer capable of making. This is also going to be important when we look at mutation because it, a single change in a base could actually result in a different amino acid going into uh, a protein chain, which may change its function, or there could be even more serious consequences. Or, of course, um, because of some inbuilt redundancy, no effect, uh, no obvious effect at all. 
So here are the amino acids just for you to have a quick look at. The important thing about these processes is how they work together through the complementarity of bases to give us a polypeptide sequence. That is a sequence of amino acids which are growing on the polypeptide chain as we look specifically at the ribosome. So we've got our messenger RNA, we've got our codons, we've got our anticodons, and we've got our specific amino acid that is linked to the transfer RNA that is going to be introduced through a peptide bond to the uh, adjacent amino acid. And this is how this process occurs. It's a very complex process with lots and lots of steps. Um, some really important molecules that do a fantastic job of taking information and transferring and translating that information from a series of nucleotide bases into a series of amino acids. It's a beautiful system and thank you for staying with us for this long while we talk through it. We will have a look at a couple of other aspects of this in the upcoming videos. Thanks for watching.